I'm a full-time parent. I'm responsible for our smallest attendee here, little Logan, who's maybe <laughs> being looked after by you. And around that occasion, I write some code, allegedly. So I'm here today to talk to you about the future of PostgreSQL and Django, otherwise known as Tony Skeletons playing nicely with each other. So I hope I don't have to explain what Django is to anyone. Room, but just to quickly remind you what Postgres is. Postgres is a database. It's probably the most popular database there is that's used, supported by Django. Just as a sh quick show of hands, who has a website in production running Postgres in the room? I think that's at least 80% of you. <laughs> who, whose websites don't run Postgres and they wish they did? Yep, yep, that's a good view. <laughs> Certainly talking to the core team, it's definitely most of our favorite databases. Possibly not shy, but most of the rest of us. <laughs> You'd rather use it. <laughs> um, now, now, why is that? It's partly due to a snarky error message in the South Code, um, but it's also due to the fact that it has probably the widest feature set that is supported databases. Um, it's a fast moving project, there are actually new releases that happen and have new features in, um, and it can be a real open source project that isn't owned by our own. So, it's a pretty good database. Um, but some of these reasons are actually not, apart from the transactional schema changes, don't actually affect most normal Django users. It's got all these shiny data types and people like Christoph and Craig have stood up on stage and spoken to me on a number of occasions, and the rest of us, and uh, all of these wonderful features, and then you go and try and use one. Well, there's, there's lots of third-party projects that try and support these custom data types. Some of them are quite good, and some of them aren't. Some of them they have varying levels of support and feature completeness and maintenance. And to be honest, some of that is our fault. It's because actually doing some of these features is rather difficult. It's quite easy to make a field that will store it, it will represent a certain data type in Python and store it in Django, store it in the database. But actually doing anything interesting with that, like querying it, is rather more problematic until 1.7. So th there are other things that are still so, in the beginning of this year, I ran a Kickstarter, largely inspired by Andrew, uh, hoping that it would have similar levels of success. Um, the intention of this was largely to expand on building a new module called django.contract.postgres, which will be built into Django and will support a selection of these exciting, shiny features that Postgres will have. Um, and I would say, wow, thank you very much. Uh, there was £14,000 raised, which is a fantastic amount of money for me. Um, and that includes just about covering all of the stretch goals, apart from the hidden secret goal that I didn't tell you about. <laughs> but frankly, that was rewriting model base, and as the core team will tell you, there'd be dragons, and I don't want to go there. So thank you very much for not giving me that much money. <laughs> this is the point where I have to say some specific thank yous. Thank you very much, in particular, to the Django Software Foundation. Judy Carter, Tangent Labs, and Django Stars for their particular gener particularly generous contributions, but also to Lincoln Loop, MCO, Robotnik, Paso, and my former employers in Kuna for their other also quite significant contributions, and to all of these people. <laughs> I have to say, much of the substantial contributions from some of the big companies and so on were very greatly received. Some of the ones that meant the most to me were the couple of pounds that were sent by individuals working in developing countries who obviously didn't have a lot of money to give and don't have companies with multi-million pound investments who were willing to throw a little bit towards to say thank you very much for helping with this. So I probably owe you a progress update. At the moment I've got an incomplete version of the first feature. Um, as, I, as I said earlier, my main job at the moment is I'm a full-time parent. Um, my wife works in a school and has some nice extensive holidays, and the majority of this work is going to take place between July and August this year, about two months of fairly solid work, and a lot of these new features should land nicely in the middle of the awkward thing release cycle. So, my main purpose of this talk is to talk through what some of these features are, talk in a little bit more detail about how some of them might work and might not work, and in some places suggest some of the things that I'm not completely sure exactly where we should go so that you can Come and talk to me in the rest of the week and tell me how you think they should be. Mark, so, can you speak up a little bit? Just hold the mic a bit higher. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. So, the main core of the project 
is to build support for a number of data types which largely only exist in Postgres and don't exist in the other databases. So, the first one of these, that's the one that I've made some progress on already, and mostly it's just missing documentation at this point, if arrays. We've also got HStore, JSON, enumerator fields, unique identifiers, um, intervals, and ranges. So, array fields. These allow you to store lists of just about any data type you can think of. Um, they have relatively limited use cases, but they're incredibly useful when you do want them. They go for like orders of preference and that kind of thing. Um, you can also store lists of lists, store nest the structures, the nests have to be square, but that works out okay. There's a restriction which is actually a sort of more like a Postgres restriction that you can't have relational data. Hopefully I don't have to explain why a, an array of many to many fields is a completely bonkers idea. Um, but an array of foreign keys could be useful. Unfortunately Postgres will not enforce referential integrity on these and therefore we shouldn't have that either. You can emulate it by doing an array of integers if you want to and store the IDs in there, but you have to be aware that it's not going to tell you if there's something that references it and it might break at some point. There is a ticket on the Postgres tracker to try and build in referential integrity, but it's blocked at the moment for performance reasons and it's too slow. This, the implementation of this is pretty much there. It comes with obviously full test suite and a form field, both in sort of simple form field for use in simple forms and also in a more advanced one that will work in the admin and it's been shining up with some nice JavaScript. Um, and it just needs some documentation and I'm hoping to get it committed this week. So this will be our first shiny new feature for 1.8. I'm going to do it exactly. I'm not going to do another one this week as well. <laughs> Next one, HStore. This is probably the most popular Postgres specific feature that there is at the moment. It's basically a key value store and it kind of gives you a limited, slight extensible sort of date doc, um, document object model that you can add on. So you can just dump extra stuff in here without having to add columns. It only supports strings, so it's a string to string map. It's very simple, it's one dimensional, but it does the job really, really well. And it's also very efficient. So you can query it well, it works well, and actually it's also the one with the best third party project. But, um, Django HStore is very good, it has good support for the Django admin, it has form fields that come with it, it works well, it's well supported. It's being updated for the new custom lookups in Django 1.7 at the moment, which I've been helping out with a bit. They do know I'm building this and they're, they're very happy to do so, but a lot of it is going to be very similar code to exist in Django HStore. So, a few subtle differences, but the migration path should be quite easy, and they're going to help me with the implementation to go into core. Jason. There are at least five, and that's a very conservative estimate, fields knocking around in the third party ecosystem for putting JSON in a text field normally. Um, these basically just take a JSON object on one end and put it in a text field and put it back out again, and that's about what you can do with it. Um, it's actually quite simple, which is probably why there's a lot of implementations of it. It's very difficult to do a good implementation of it for the admin or something. So they're all quite simple, most of them work, but they're actually not, not very clever. There is now a JSON data type, as of Postgres 9.2, I believe, in Postgres. But it's also actually quite limited. It, the only thing it really gains you over the previous one are some very slow querying methods and that it will enforce at the database level that it's actually valid JSON. But given that you just use json.dumps to send it to the database, one would hope it's going to be valid JSON. So it works, but it's not exactly very clever. What's quite exciting is in the 9.4 release, fingers crossed, it has been committed, but we're not, uh, may still be removed for regression or something. But hopefully, in the Postgres 9.4 release, which is due around October, there's going to be a thing called JSON B, otherwise known as binary JSON. At the moment, JSON data type in Postgres is basically just a string. It just checks what it is, but it stores it internally as a string. It doesn't actually know what's inside that string. When it wants to, if you want to query on the key of on the certain key of your JSON, Postgres does a sequential scan, passes all the JSON, and loads out the rows that match. This is not really an ideal situation, 
JSON B is where well, it says binary JSON, that means it's going to store the JSON as a binary representation that it understands what's going on underneath it. So you can query it, and you can look into it. And also it will have this nice thing called an equality operator, which the current JSON one doesn't have. Uh, but one of the third party projects does use the JSON data type and they've run into some difficulties where certain aggregate queries in Django would fail because you can't use a JSON data type in Postgres inside a group by because it can't compare with them. It's a bit messy. So, as a result of this not actually coming out in Postgres until October, this is likely to get pushed to the 1.9 release of Django and just support the new meta JSON B release. So, if anyone's thinking of writing one for JSON B, probably go to the one. Or come and help them, which would be even better. Enumerated data types. This is one of the, one of the few shiny Postgres things that actually exists in other databases. It's in MySQL as well. Um, it's basically choices on steroids. Um, it's choices that exist in your database. Um, they're enforced at the database level. The implementation of them is not that exciting, but what I'm hoping to do is actually expand on get through display methods that we have on our models to actually provide a nice way of accessing pipe and constants with it so that we have a better API. I'm sure pretty much everybody in the room has written an integer field or a car field with choices on it and then probably define some constants somewhere, which is a constant so that you can compare to them and there's various different patterns for doing them. I'm not a particular fan of any of the patterns that I've seen. So it would be nice to have a better API for defining choices where you're going to use them like this. A, a simple example, a restriction of enumerated fields is you want to use them for something where there are a very limited number of options and they're unlikely to change regularly because when they change, that's going to require a new operation because you actually have to like, tell the database they're doing new types. But as an example, if you wanted to do, if you were categorizing your ticket into infants and children and, and grown ups and old age pensioners, you're unlikely to add a new kind of age group afterwards, or if you do, it's going to be a fairly significant upheaval. You're going to have a load of code changes that go with it, so it's not too much of a problem to run the database change at the same time. What you might not want to do this for is something where you've got lots, then you're better off doing a separate table and a foreign key to that table. There's a kind of middle ground of domains that exist in Postgres. UIDs. Um, this is basically an alternative to your normal sequential ID field. Um, they're becoming increasingly popular at the moment with the rise of these exciting JavaScript frameworks where the JavaScript framework wants to assign an ID and it's a globally unique ID and it knows it's going to be safe and not crash and then it expects to keep that ID forever. Um, they're, they're a very good idea, especially when you've got large data sets and they can actually be more efficient in some ways than the very large, very large integers. Um, avoid certain fun race conditions and so on as well. When this one actually gets interesting in this implementation is by delegating the creation of that new ID into the database. So in the same way as when I create um, an ID field at the moment, I don't tell the database to make it the next number, I just say, make it the next number. And it pulls out what the next number is from the sequence, adds it on, and, tell, and Jack, it tells Django what the ID of that record is. So at the moment we, only, we can only do that with auto fields. It, the idea is to be able to add auto-like functionality to other database fields as well. So a UID field, a big auto field for those projects that need more than a normal size serial. There's a big serial data type that works nicely in Postgres for doing this. Being able to update it to do that kind of thing, that's where the, the interest is going to come in this picture. Two really simple but really useful ones. Um, which aren't, gonna, are not particularly exciting in their implementation, but are, in my opinion, very useful when you need them. The first of these is the Postgres data type called interval, which we would know better as the time delta. Basically, allows you to store 10 minutes, 27 hours, however long it took Russell to get here from Australia. <laughs> the other one is range. I'm sure most people in the room have also written a model with a start foo and an end foo, or a begin foo and an end foo, min foo, max foo, these kind of features. Um, those work perfectly fine, but they're a bit clunky, um, and they also don't allow, they, it can be awkward to write clever things like, is this, you know, get me all of the things where this is in the range. So it's all the ones where it's greater than the start time and less than the end time. And those queries aren't very quick. 
They can be made much quicker in Postgres by using a range type. There exist built-in range types for times and for numbers at least. I think there might be one or two others, um, but those are the ones that you're most likely to use. Um, you can also do really nice things like you can add a constraint to that field so that for a given value of a foreign key, then the ranges aren't allowed to overlap. So that's perfect if, for example, you're doing a booking system, you can say for any particular room, you can't overlap the timestamps. So that's quite a nice feature. Um, it's a fairly simple data type, but it's got some, got some nice usage. It's, got some, it's a nice example of one of those where the real power in it is how you query it, not just in storing that data and loading it out again. And this is something that historically, Django has made more difficult. Hopefully, not anymore. Um, due to some sterling work by Hansi in one of my personal favorite features, sorry Andrew, in Django 4.7, is custom lookups which are actually slightly more than lookups. There are lookups and there are transforms, and the difference is important. For those of you who speak maths, lookups are binary operations and transforms are unary operations. For those of you who don't speak maths, lookups are something like less than, where it makes sense to say this thing is less than something else, but you need the something else for it to make sense. Transforms are things where you don't need that. So for example, lowercase. It makes sense to say I'm going to lowercase this and then I can do something else with it. I'm going to round this to the nearest whole number and then I'm going to say is it less than or greater than something. At the moment, they're only supported in filter and fix with and add to queue. They're only supported in filtering queries. They're not supported in things like um, values and values list, where transforms do make sense and are hopefully going to be useful. Um, I'm hoping to do that for, and um, I think that's on various models. I might get round to this list um, in the future to support these and the query API in a slightly wider range of Django. It seems to be working nicely in 1.7 at the moment. Go and play with it. Um, this brings me nicely on to one of the first stretch goals, which is to basically change our database lookups into database transforms. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that instead of... So, okay, at the moment, you can do start date, double underscore year equals 2012. That's great. If you want to get everything that happens in 2012, then Django will interpret that into a sensible query where it does less than a certain timestamp and greater than a certain timestamp and do a sensible thing. That's not so helpful if you've actually put in a custom index that does all the extract, because it doesn't use the extract, it uses some ranges. And it also doesn't, it, if I want to do something a bit more complicated than that, where I want to say the year is less than 2012. Then I have to think for a minute and go, okay, so that means that the timestamp is less than midnight on the 1st of January 2012, and I need to create that timestamp object and then do a comparison to it. It would be nice if I could go double underscore year, double underscore less than 2012. That would be a natural thing to do. So that's what we're going to build, and I'm going to write, I say optimized, I mean sensible queries for all of the different databases, for all of the different possibilities. And at the same time, add some new lookups that are specific to Postgres for those people who might, for some reason, wish to interact with milliseconds or the decade or the century from the date timestamp. Because you can do that in Postgres, so why not? I ran into an interesting thing looking at these custom lookups when I was building some new ones for the array fields. Because arrays, you want to say, what's the first element? What is this element in there at all? And that's, at the moment, we have a number of of a number of standard lookups that exist across all Django fields, which are really very specific to text. So, one of the things you can do with a new array field is say, filter where array double underscore naught equals hello. So this will basically get you all the rows where the first string in my array of strings is the string hello. You can also do this, where array double underscore starts with hello. Now to me, this ought to do the same thing as the first example. It doesn't. It will pull up the record from the first example, but it will also pull up the rating record where the first item is not hello, it's hello world. <coughs> it's a different string that happens to also start with hello. Because what actually happens is it casts the array into a string and then does a string operation. Now, you can kind of see why this might make some sense in this case. In the case with contains, it really doesn't, because I've overloaded array contains to look for is this string one of the strings in the array? Is this in the list? 
And then you do eye contact and it casts it into a string and does a case of sense of searcher. Which isn't really very consistent. A possibility is to do away with these string-based lookups on all Django fields that aren't actually string-based. Why would you want to do integer field starts with three? That's a crazy thing to do. Or if you are going to do that, you at least ought to really know that you're going to do that. And you know that you're doing a string-based operation on something that isn't string-based. I need to look into how well this is going to work with other databases, but something that would work really nicely with Postgres is to have a global transform that's always available called text that will dump it in the database to being text, and then that opens up all of your string-based operations. Obviously, you wouldn't need this if the field is string-based to start. This is a possibility. It might be quite nice. It would be backwards incompatible because it would remove the ability to do things like date time starts with the year, but it's fairly easy to change that to just be year is this. Jacob is giving me a thumbs up in the back. So, so hopefully that's a good sign that it's a good idea, but if you disagree, come and tell me before I do it. Other stretch goals. Postgres has four main built-in index types. It has B-trees, hashes, gists, and gins. Now, this is where it's going to test my memory. B-tree is the standard index. That's what you use, that's what will normally happen in most cases. Hash is an index that is really, really fast for equality and doesn't do anything else. So it doesn't improve ordering, it doesn't improve less than queries, but, it may, but it's even faster if you want to do exact queries. Gist is for spatial data and gin is for arrays and, and edge stores or the other way around, I can't remember. Um, I think it's that way around. They're basically customized index types that are good for complex data, data types. Generally speaking, you're unlikely to want to do use a particularly different one unless you're in a fairly specialized use case where you want a huge amount of data and you only really ever look up at it with exact in which case you might want a hash rather than a B-tree. At the moment, we don't provide any API in Django to do that. What's more common with Postgres is that you want to use two of the Postgres's more clever indexes, which are either expression indexes or partial indexes. So an expression index is pretty much where you want to index by a transform that I mentioned earlier. So instead of indexing on a string field, you want to index on the lowercase representation of the string field. It's every time you query on that string field, you do a case insensitive search. And the index helps a bit, but it doesn't really help very much if you just do a normal index. Another example is a partial index, where the best example of where a partial index is useful is actually in the Postgres docs, so I'm going to repeat it. Um, imagine you're running a company where you have orders. You've been running for 10 years. You've got tens of thousands of orders, probably millions of orders in your table, and you've got a web interface that the people in your shipping department use to work out what's going on that does a bunch of queries against this table. They actually only care about the things that haven't been shipped. You very rarely go and look at what happened 10 years ago. Now, you could choose to archive them off into other tables and so on, but Postgres will handle 10 million rows in the table quite happily, but it will be slower to query. So you can produce the indexes that you need given a certain condition. So you can say index this column only on the only on the tape only on the rows where this record is lost. That index will store a huge amount of less data. If you do ordering queries on it, it will be that much faster to order, and it will work really nicely for that sort of use case. It's a fairly specialised use case, but when you need one, it's really really useful. So here's an example of what the API for these could look like. It's very much I've thrown it together. It might be. Sensible. So, you might be able to specify the index type by saying, so in this instance, this is a B tree index with start date. So if I just put start date, in this case, it would do the same. But if I said hash of start date, it would use a different index type in the database. And, and then the one underneath, where I've got country double underscore lower, that's referring to a non existent transform called lower, but that would be on the country. Um, so, that would, give, that would do an index on the lower type. <coughs> the, the lowercase version in sets up in expression. This would sort of replace, you could put a tuple in here, which would be, behave like index together does. We could also add other things like on this one, I've got an example where I've got a keyword argument called where, so this is going to produce a partial index. You could have unique equals true. You could potentially even have other constraints in this as well, and it would sort of supersede unique together, index together, and possibly db index equals true on the fields as well. So it would be 
All the field definitions here will be index definitions in one place on the index. It's a possibility, has some backwards compatibility, incompatibility issues. There are some of the other databases that have custom index types as well. Um, it may or may not be sensible to implement these in these cases. The last of the stretch goals, which we just got to, is to do with views and materialized views. For those of you who haven't worked much with databases directly, you may well never have used a view. A view is a table-like object that you can query, but you can't write to. So you can select stuff from it. It's basically based off another query. And it looks like a table, you can query it like a table, you can join it with other tables, but you can't write anything to it. Postgres as of 9.2 or 9.3, fairly recently, um, also has something called the materialized view, which is actually stored on disk and you have to explicitly go and refresh. Um, so you have to tell, this will store it, in, store it on the disk. It's useful for certain reporting situations. It's, they've got some problems at the moment. In particular, they tend to lock the tables when you're, when you're updating them. Um, but in certain circumstances, that can work quite nicely for if you're only based in one country, you just want to update, it doesn't matter that your report views are out of date. They're good for sort of big aggregates where the, the data that you're producing is quite small, but you need to be able to query on it properly. But the data that you're producing it from involves a massive aggregate query that's going to take 10 minutes to run. So you can't run that every time you want to do the query. At the moment, you can kind of do views in Django. You create a model, you make it manage faults, you specify the database table, you create the view yourself or using a using a migration, and you sort of arbitrarily pick one of the fields and say this is the primary key, so Django doesn't complain at you. Um, and then you just remember that this is a view and you don't want to use the update method or a save method and you hope that you don't do it wrong and everything like that. So it'd be nice to actually have a proper way of doing these, but all of those features don't exist, so you can't cheat yourself in the um, So here's a possible API again. We can have a set of this would live, as I say, this exists on all the databases. So instead of just having um, instead, of, instead of just having Django.db.models, we can have Django.db.views, which would have I think all the view in it that you can import. Um, in its class meta, potentially, you could define its query set, which would be a values query set, so it defines the, the columns of the view that you're creating. Um, and that, <coughs> I suppose, that we're just filtering, we want a view that only contains all the places where it's true. Why you would use these, they can make some queries more efficient, and they don't want to use materialized view. You might use them because your DBA tells you you should use them. <laughs> Nonetheless, there are use cases where you might want to use them, and it would be nice if when you do use them, they behave like Django model to query, but they don't behave like doing anything you can't do with them. So, what else might we be able to do in the future? I spoke a little bit when I was talking about the custom indexes about constraints. Postgres has really nice abilities, basically put whatever sort of constraint you like. When I was talking about those range fields earlier, I said you can put in a constraint at the database level to say this range can't overlap. I can't, at the moment, we don't have a way of saying to Django, this is going to happen, the database is going to sort it out for you. Maybe we want to check it in the form as well, but if it's a slow query, just let the database tell us if it's not valid, and then we'll carry on. But we want the database to enforce that, because in some cases it might be important business logic. So we can add this sort of constraint feature into the <coughs> indexes thing or something similar to that. We actually use constraints in both references, in unique, um, and also in positive integer <coughs> constraints. Andrew might know what else has constraints, but I think that's about it. Um, so if you create a positive integer field, Postgres won't actually let you say the negative number in there. It's not just database, it's not just validation, it's done on the Python side, it's done in the database as well. There are a number of sort of features that were requested of me that aren't part of the Kickstarter. But I think that people said, oh, could you do this as well? <laughs> like, uh, maybe, that depends how much money you give me. Uh, and that's the answer is not enough. So, <laughs> <laughs> I've got enough to do. The first one of these is server-side curses. These are, the primary use case for these is management commands where you want to operate on the entirety of a certain table and that table has so many rows in it that if you load them all into memory as a Python object at once, you load the box up because you've got out of memory. 
This allows you to do the iteration through your rows in the table on the database side and you can turn them in batches, you can process them, drop, uh, push them out, and then we get the garbage collected and then pull in the next set. <coughs> they have a relatively easy they're quite a little bit complicated to implement and they're in quite a separate area of the code base from where I'm working on. But I think we got to a point with some discussions regarding them that they do make sense and they are worth doing. So if anybody's really interested in doing them, I think there are people in the core team who would like to see <coughs> contributions towards this existing, or maybe work some themselves. But if you're interested in what those and want them, then look them, look them up on track and on the mailing list, there are some discussions about how they work. Similar to that are prepared statements. Prepared statements within Django, on, especially with Postgres, are they you need to the connection with Postgres. So they're not as useful as you might think. But there are situations where you have a view where you're running similar, slightly complicated queries with different parameters 15 or 20 times. And in those cases, by doing a prepared statement, so the query management once, and then you execute that query 15 times, can improve the efficiency of your page by a margin. Not by an enormous amount, but in certain edge cases it can be quite significant. They're probably more useful on databases that aren't Postgres and are more rubbish at writing query plans and better at executing them. <laughs> so, they would be useful. They're going to be unique to the particular request. There was a discussion that went on on the mailing list already a couple of months ago about possible APIs for them. I think there was a general consensus that was reached. They seemed to make some sense, so that would be good if anybody's interested in it. Native table inheritance. Postgres actually has its own version of inheritance between tables. Uh, it kind of works. Um, personally, table, I'm not convinced that table inheritance is ever a particularly good idea. Um, have, if you've ever inherited a website with a large amount of this has been used in Django, then I'm sure you'll appreciate why it would be no fun whatsoever. Um, it's possible to build. I'm not even sure it's a good idea to build. The last one is more likely. Um, one of the rules that has been largely self-imposed but encouraged by other members of the core team is that django.contrib.postgres is going to be hack-free. We're not having another contrib.gis. So where I want to change the way that the RRM works, uh, for example, I want to be able to add custom indexes, a lot of which are specific to Postgres. But in order to do that, we're going to work with the main RRM to make it more flexible, more understandable, more amenable to what we need and just put the Postgres specific graph in contract.postgres. With contract.gis, we are needed to do that. Largely, there's a lot of hacks that are applied. There's a bit of monkey patching. It's got better over time, but there are still things like, in all, Postgres needs an extension installed to run database But it's not a different database. You just have to install the participational extension into Postgres, and then it should just work. And the only thing that the custom backend does is install that extension on the test data. That's about all it does. I mean, um, it has some feature flags as well to say that certain things are possible. Um, in some, with some of the other databases, like the difference between SQLite and Spatialite, it's quite important that they're actually you know, they're completely different databases. They just share some other code. With Postgres, that's not the case, and it would be nice to not require that custom database back end. I've got a very strict rule that contract.postgres is not going to require a separate database back end. It should just use it. <laughs> So in the process of doing some of these things to ensure that we don't have these hacks in contrib.postgres, we should hopefully be able to remove some of the hacks that are in contrib.gis and work towards having an implementation of contrib.gis that is a lot cleaner and a lot more maintainable than the current situation. By doing this, and by making the RM more flexible in the process, it should be easier to write, custom, to write other things that you might want to do that are clever with your database. One of the really exciting things you can do in Postgres that makes no sense to support directly in Django is that you can define your own data type to do whatever you want to do. You can, I've, I've seen an implementation of a web server in, in, that actually renders HTML pages in, with some JavaScript and loads the data straight out of the database and all exists in Postgres. It can do completely crazy things that you definitely want to do. But you might have want to do some clever things where you push your push the processing down into the database, you might want to set the box of processing requirements or whatever, and it should be easier after this work has been done 
to extend the ORM in your third party project without having to apply some parental funds patches. Okay. I'm Mark Tannen, I'm MJ Tannen on pretty much everything. And you can read updates on my progress on postgres.mjtannen.co.uk. Um, I am very happy to talk to anyone during the week. If anybody's got anything more detailed to talk about to do with this, has anybody got any questions? <laughs>